Whether you call it football or soccer in your part of the world, Match of the Day Africa Top 10 is the podcast from the BBC World Service ranking the best African players. This guy is recognised as the best in the world. Teams. The ball coming, turn, boom. And the biggest moments in African football. The whole world remembers that. Remember that, yeah. It's not just African fans. Match of the Day Africa Top 10. Find it wherever you get your BBC podcasts. Katie. She has many boyfriends, and the boy, they like her so much. I don't know uh, why, but... You couldn't see it, personally, no. (laughs) Katie, this girl with lots of boyfriends, is extremely clever. She's good at managing awkward group situations, and she likes a good time. She also likes having fun with the boys. You find some females, they have a boyfriend in the community. Oh, I've got a bit on the side. On the side. Very cheeky. Yeah, cheeky. And Katie had loads. And then, if they want to go to have sex somewhere behind the bush, they use the sign. <laughs> Katie isn't just any ordinary girl. She's a chimpanzee. She was very, very cheeky. Uh, very cheeky. <laughs> I love that for her. What does it take to know a really fierce animal like a chimpanzee and read its behaviour correctly? years of experience, or some kind of gift. Stani Niandwi has both of those things. He's helped chimps recover from being circus acts or pets in someone's living room, and he knows only too well that underneath what some people see as chimp cuteness lies a wildness that shouldn't be messed with. The world-famous primatologist Jane Goodall has called Stani a chimpanzee whisperer. He's so good at reading them. He understands their signs. He can judge their moods and communicate with them in Pantoot, their identification call. But Stani also speaks five other languages. He's had to move to many different countries, pulled across borders partly because of his work with chimps, but also on the move from war in his home country, Burundi. In his life, Stani has helped countless chimps, but it turns out they've saved him too. Welcome to Lives Less Ordinary. I'm Indy Rackerson. Stani grew up in a rural village in Burundi in the late 60s. He was the seventh child of ten in a family who all belonged to the Hutu ethnic group. Where I born it was in the very, very rural areas, in the mountain. To go in the, in the city, it was difficult. There was no, no transport. It was a village in the deep, 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 deep mountain. No hospital at the time was near. And uh, coffee farms everywhere. What was life like in the village? The life, it was uh, very, very hard Hmm. to get water. We have uh, to go to some kilometers to get water, to face water in the river. To get firewood, we have uh, to go in the bush to collect firewood. Mm. To get help like medication if you are sick, it was very difficult because, as I said, there was no no hospital clinic around. There was no school nearby. I remember even where I got to primary, it was very far. I used to wake up in the morning, like six. So I have to travel like two hours by foot. Wow, that's far away. Without shoes in the foot. And then you have to use another two hours to come back home. When he wasn't going to school, Stanny would help his mother grow the vegetables for the family to eat. But when he could, he'd sneak off and hunt birds with his friends, or he'd gather a football team together. I used it to make a ball from banana leaves or banana fibers. Like wrapping them up into a ball shape? Yes, I rubbing it together. So when I go into school, I have to go with that one. And then I have to select the team because I'm a boss, I, I, I went with the, the ball. I had, so I have to select nice. the friend who can join. Yeah, yeah. Okay, so like a team, you're the captain. Yeah, I'm captain. So mm-hmm. if I don't like you, I will have to remove you. Oh, the power, Stanny. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so true, isn't it? When you're little, you like the power comes in such interesting little ways, doesn't it? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but growing up as a Hutu was complicated. The government and military were mostly in the hands of the Tutsis, and tensions between the two groups could run really high. Stanley's father worried about him going to school. He thought his son would become even more of a target as an educated Hutu. You left school when you were 13, didn't you? And you started selling sugar cane. Yeah, the school I, I went, it was not every day. I think it was three times in a week. And the other days, 
I was uh, trying to make money. And so I started selling sugar cane in the market. I have to carry my uh, sugar cane for many, many kilometers. It's so almost like four hours. I was trying to see how I can support uh, my family, mom and uh, my sisters. Mm. Well, you started to work for families in the city, didn't you, as a houseboy? Can you tell me how that job came to you? How you how you knew about it? Our neighbor who went in the city early, and he spent there many months, and then he came back, and uh, we saw him with new shirt, trousers, and the shoes. Mm. Oh, he was looking better. Mm-hmm. And uh, my mom, I think, he asked him if he can also take me. So and there was so many rich people who want boys like like me at the time to go to work as a house boy. And were they mainly Hutu boys? Yes, mostly mainly mm. Hutu. Did you want to go? Oh yeah, I was very excited because I wanted also okay. to look like like him. Yeah. So I was no doubting I wanted to go immediately because I wanted to look like him. I wanted to have the good clothes. So he took me to some family. He was. He became like an agent. Mm. Maybe that's what the new trainers and the shiny watch were all about. It's, yes. So I went with him, and then he took me to certain family. Was uh, they want the boy they can use for cleaning the house, uh, washing the clothes, facing the water. But it was quite a poor family. They were a poor family. So did they pay you? They didn't pay me. Not at all. Yeah, I spent it there for almost a year. They didn't pay me. That's slavery. It is, it is, but it was in a different way. It, is, it was a slavery in the in the, in the country. So, so Stanley, you're away from home in the city, working for no money, not even earning any money. And then you remember, I'm a kid, so I can't ask pay you me. I'm a kid. Yeah. So, working, working, working. So I was living in the hope that maybe next month they will give me something. But the family never did. Month after month. He waited for money that never arrived. So I escaped that family. And in the morning, I wake up and then I disappear. I think they wake up when I have already left. Mm. So I went to another family. Also, she was a lady. She was working, but she was no, has no husband. And she has a very little girl, three months, I think. And then she, she training me to look after her daughter when she go to work. And were you paid this time? She paid a little money. But it was a very tough job because I was also a little boy. And then I have to look after baby for three months and uh, to clean the baby, to make milk. That's why I think I became, I think I became mature quickly. <laughs> yeah. And, uh, yeah. You're having to pair your parenting. Yes. I came mature quickly and then, which somehow it had helped me to look after mm. the chimpanzee uh, because I started looking human baby earlier uh, so that's why I didn't get a problem to look after the mm-hmm. chimpanzee because uh, where I have been working with the chimpanzee we have been confiscated baby chimpanzee which they need care like human I have already experienced how to make milk for the baby how to make food for baby mm. uh, that baby also she was a girl yeah that time there was not even uh, the pampas they was using the nappies. Mm-hmm. Like cloth, like wraps. Yes. So I mm-hmm. have to change that baby. So it was, if I remember that, also how that, uh, that woman was treated me, it was even worse more than where I, uh, I started from. Eventually you made friends with a security guard and that was quite an important relationship for you. Tell me about this friend and what happened. I work with many families in the city. But the last one is where I met with security guard and he became a friend with me. As I was working inside in the house as a house boy, I used to steal food for him and then I give him something to eat in the evening when he came to report. And also to give him cold water from a fridge. And one day he told me about Jenny Goddard Institute, which is going to study in Burundi. So this is the first time that you've heard of Dr. Jane Goodall? And the work that she does. Yes, it was the first time. Okay. What did he tell you about it? So he told me that they are going to start Jenny Goda Institute, where they are going to keep a chimpanzee. This would be a place for orphaned and rescued chimps. And Stanny's friend said he'd try to fix Stanny a job there too. 
the work and wages would be a vital step and help him escape his work as a houseboy. And a few months later, it happened. The new job meant that Stanny had to wake up at 3am to walk four hours from his village to arrive at work on time. But it was new, it paid, and suddenly his days were in the company of chimpanzees. My road was to look after the compound and to open a gate. I spent there for almost a year before I touched the chimps. So there was a training meet. When you pass here, we will borrow to go to where we put the rubbish. They told me I have to pass far away. The chimps, they are very strong. They don't touch any chimps. don't allow mm-hmm. the chimps to, to touch you. But sometime I have to stop to push with the barrel. And then I just watching them, how they look like human. They really do, don't they? Yeah, how they yeah. look like human, especially when they give you food. I was interested to see how they eat, how they peel banana, mm. how they drink water in the barrels. And mm. then there was this guy who carrying two or three baby chimps. And then I also used to get excited. How? What? I wish if it also me, I can touch that chimps. Well, if I can get a chance to touch the baby chimps. Then one day, he did get close enough to touch them. My boss, he told me to sit near him. And then he started training me. And then I remember uh, there was a young boy chimps, they called him Maxi. Maxi was one of the first chimps to really make an impact on Stanny. He'd been rescued from a French film crew when he was just two years old. And Maxi was interested in Stanny. So with the help of his boss, Stanny got up close. As a way of greeting, Maxi slowly stretched out one of his legs towards Stanny. And Stanny slowly, slowly did the same until their toes touched. And then Max, he pulled out again his feet and then he's smearing. That's how they can understand. Oh, okay. I have never touched you before. Yeah. And they smooth like, oh, I don't know. I don't recognise this smell. Who's this guy? <laughs> yes. <laughs> <laughs> so he's smearing and then he brought it back his foot to touch again. And then I did the same. And uh, he did again, and then I did also. So that is what the first time to touch the chimpanzee. Wow. Well, how did you feel after that? I was feeling like uh, I was too much excited. Too much excited. I couldn't believe in, uh, even. And then also I was feeling also, to, oh, today I also have touched the chimps and then. Mm. But I think my boss also, he saw something in me. Because also, uh, I think I was a patient, which uh, some people, they are not patient. Because it, from that, I never stopped training until I got uh, full training. And then also, I started also working with the shift with other keepers. I was allowed also to hold the chimps because at that time there was many baby chimps. And also the chimps, they adopted me. They like me. So... What, whilst you were working at the Jane Goodall Institute in Burundi, in 1992, you got married, didn't you? <laughs> yeah, uh, I married well, my wife, which we are still together even now. We have a children. Yeah, this is your wife, Nawera, yeah? Yes. And then a couple of years later, so a couple of years after you got married, and when you're still working at the Jane Goodall Institute, in 1994, ethnic conflict in Burundi escalates into full-scale civil war. And at first, war's broken out, but you were still going to work, weren't you? Yeah, because uh, you don't have nothing home to look after the family. You have to sacrifice yourself to go. It was not a sweet time. No. And of course, you are Hutu. You're a Hutu man. And you're living in a country where the government and the military are in the hands of the Tutsis, and you're still walking a long walk to and from work every day when the conflict begins. That must have been quite risky. Yeah, I didn't give up. Mm. I was still going to work. But I remember many times I reached somewhere, you look ahead, you see the road, it is clear. But you just see a small group of young people from Tutsi community. So when they see the Hutu, they have to chasing, like hunting animals. 
So I survived in that in many times. The Tutsi soldiers would see Stani, a Hutu man, and chase him like an animal. And because every journey to and from work was a risk, Stani began sleeping at the sanctuary, leaving his wife and two children in their village. But after two months of living at work, he and his colleague were desperate to get back to their homes. So, two Western bosses from the Jane Goodall Institute drove Stani and his colleague partway up the mountain, thinking this would be safer, hoping that it would protect the Hutu men. So we we were in, in the ambush of the military, they stopped that vehicle, mm-hmm. and they have to remove us from that vehicle. Uh, my boss, one was from America, another one was from Australia. But the one from America, she was a tough lady, say, why you remove this, this uh, innocent people? This is my workers. They are innocent. We give lift, lift to home. And the military, they were very tough, say, keep it quiet. And uh, they say, we are counting one, two, three, move from here. So they were chasing mm-hmm. our bosses. Go! If you continue shouting, we are, we are going to kill you. And uh, they ask if we have an identity card. And then they told us to sit. They stamp on us. They kick us with their, their boots. And you know military boat how they are strong. Uh, to kick someone with that boat in, in the head, you mm-hmm. can feel it. And uh, they discuss themselves. You know what? Yeah, don't use a bullet. Just pull down in the road and then use a barnet. Barnet it is that knife which it is in the in the in the in the guns. Yeah. I think that maybe we survive because I think they got a bit scared. If they kill us, my bosses they are going maybe to to write, maybe to report to BBC or to American embassy, whatever. I think that it what it saved us. Stani's bosses were shocked and upset at what had happened to their employees. And they give us a hug. Mm. And they crying. And then they ask how we feel. Some of us, we couldn't even talk. No. And uh, he bought the soda. He tried to give us to drink, but I think the throat it was already closed. I didn't have any appetite for drink. Mm. They wanted to talk to us, but the word can't come out. After this event, a decision is made to move the chimps and some of the workers as well out of the country, it's just not safe enough anymore, to Kenya. You decide to go with the chimps and to take them to Nairobi. And this would mean leaving your wife and your children behind, wouldn't it? How did that, how did that feel? Yeah, it was a very, it was a very sad and a broken heart. Mm. Because when I went, I told the mom and the, my wife, you know, I'm going to the chimps, but I don't know. But I, I told them I will, I come back. I will come back. That what it give them comfort. Mm. But it was a very sad, very sad. But I took that decision. Uh, even when we, we reached to the airplane and then we rode the chimps in the plane and then closed the door. Uh, I don't know. I have no word even I can tell you to how I was feeling. Mm-hmm. Your, and your, your boys were very little, weren't they? They were very little. Very mm-hmm. little. One was uh, nine months. Mm. And then I went. So that it was the end of uh, see some of my, my people. Because my mom, who I said, I'm going, I will come back. I never see her again. My brother, my sister, my wife. Many years without communication. There was no plane to fly from Akita country to Burundi. There was no post. There was nothing. Stani's decision to leave his young family behind was a decision made in the worst circumstances. Not leaving would mean he'd be out of a job and wouldn't be able to support his family at a desperate time. Leaving, he hoped would be short-term. He didn't realise how bad the situation in Burundi would become. So, Stani flew to Kenya with the chimps, hoping he'd go back once he'd settled them in Nairobi, far away from war. I was still hoping to go back in Burundi, but the things in Burundi became bad and bad and bad. 
it was a very difficult, it was difficult also for language because it was the first time for me to go to, to another country. New people, new environment. Kenya, it has many languages, which I have never heard because like in Burundi, it is just uh, one language. But now in Kenya, if you look in Kenya, they have many tribes, there are many languages. So when I, I hear people talking at some language I have never heard, so thinking for family I left behind, the war in the people dying, but I can't go back, I have to continue. And then I have to also to be strong, to make sure the chimps, they get support. So I... I encouraged myself to be strong to help the chimpanzee. Stani's new life in Kenya was now just him. I am in a new country. I don't have any friend. The chimps, they became my friend. In the morning, I have to walk up to go to chimps. And when they see me, they get excited because they know only me. They were thinking the same like me. I am in a new country, but they are feeling happy to see me in the morning when I come. If in me, I was feeling happy, I sit inside with them, grooming them, also them grooming me. And this really took people in Kenya by surprise. Who was this man, being groomed so lovingly by chimps? They couldn't believe they have never seen a human who can oh. sit with over 10 chimpanzee. We're grooming each other, so they couldn't believe if I am human. But the chimps, they were feeling very happy, comfortable with me. Even in me, I was feeling it. Yeah, I was going to say, you, like, it must have been really lovely for you like to have that contact, that physical contact with an, another animal. Yeah, they became as my friend, as a family. Mm. So that is the family I have at that time. After months in Kenya, Stani still hadn't had any contact with his family back in Burundi. He had no idea how they were coping as the war raged around them, or even if they were alive. Burundi was still too dangerous for Stani to return to. All he had to keep him going were the daily pressures and interactions of looking after the chimps. But Stani was making a name for himself as an expert in chimp behaviour. He had a keen eye for what the chimps needed and a very special way of working and communicating with them. This led to working on a new project in Uganda. It was on Nagamba Island in Lake Victoria, and the sanctuary was known as Chimp Island. Stani was head of integration, so he was in charge of introducing new orphaned baby chimps whose parents had been captured or killed to the wider group. And that is no easy task. Each chimpanzee has its own strong personality, quirks and interests, much like a chimp called Sunday, who'd been rescued from a circus. He know how to, how to operate in the boat, he can operate a boat. In fact, we call him Captain Sandy. <laughs> Brilliant. Is he, is he a good captain? He's a good captain. You feel safe in Sunday's boat? Because he likes to practice all the time. Uh, if you go around the, uh, around in the community, around the fishermen, mostly people, they know Sandy because he has been attacking the fishermen. Tell me about Mawa. Mawa, um, he sounds like hard work. He's a very hard work. <laughs> <laughs> Mawa is a very, very stubborn boy. He refused to be accepted in the group. He just wanted to jump the fence to escape without no reason. He had a friend, which his name is Asiga. And then Asiga also, he copied Mawa behavior. No, oh, no. So not only is he an escape artist, but he's also a trendsetter. Yes. Disaster. <laughs> I've also heard there was a chimp called Katie who um, had a lot of boyfriends. Yes. <laughs> okay, because Katie, <laughs> she has many boyfriends and the boy, they like her so much. I don't know uh, why, but... Uh, you couldn't see it. <laughs> but, <No. laughs> she was very popular, um, the boys, when she's on the heat. Uh -huh. But very, very cheeky. Uh, very cheeky. She was making the boys also fighting, but the chimps in their community is the only boss who's allowed to have sex with all females because okay. he's a power. Fine. But you find the female, they accept, but they don't like him. And uh, you find some females, they have a boyfriend in the community. 
Oh, I've got a bit on the side. On the side. Very cheeky. Yeah, cheeky. In case you had loads. And then, if they want to go to have sex somewhere behind the bush, they use the sign. <laughs> Brilliant. <laughs> Katie is very good for that. So Brilliant. Love it, Katie. But, I love that for her. If I don't tell you, <laughs> if I don't tell you, uh, you can't know what is going on. Uh, because they use sign to tell the boy, you know. Mm. I am going behind the bush. You will find me there. What does what's the sign? I'm imagining like sort of like a little come hither finger. Sometimes they they use the eyes. <laughs> oh yeah, <laughs> the eyes say everything, don't they? Uh-huh. Very important the eyes. And uh, sometimes they use uh, breaking some branches. And then Katie okay. can say, okay, if she confirm the boy has understood what's going to happen in that communication, Katie she can go behind the bush. <laughs> I love this. You know, it's it's so clear from like just just this story of Katie, the detail that you have and that you can remember of Katie. Because this was a while ago. You know, it, it's so clear that so much observation is needed, isn't it? So much time yeah. spent with the chimps. Yeah. All this time where you're you're working on Gamba Island and working with all of these fascinating and different chimps and learning so much. A former colleague of yours, Ali, who did stay in Burundi, she had been searching for your family and trying to find out where they were and if they were safe. And you did eventually hear that they were safe uh, and they'd managed to reach Rwanda as refugees with Ali. And then you found out that Ali had come back to Entebbe in Uganda, where you were staying. And your friend Debbie said, would you come over and see Ali? She's bought you something from your family, which must have been quite exciting to hear, to you know, have to have not spoken to them for so long and not seen them, to hear that Ali had bought you something from them must have been exciting. Tell me about the day that you went to meet Ali. So I was hanging around and uh, after I saw Ali came, so immediately... Ali, she came into uh, Debbie's office and then they closed the door immediately and then uh, said, let we walk to go to Debbie's house. I have to follow them. And then uh, as we was walk, I say, okay, I can't ask any news or any letter. I will ask her when we reach home and then we sit down. So we reached to Debbie's house and uh, Ali, she pretend as she's going to the toilet and then um, Debbie... Uh, she went to do something, and they told me to go in Debbie's house to put in a kettle for coffee. So when I opened the door, I find my wife and the two kids were sitting there. I was like paralyzed. I got shocked because I was not aware for anything. So, but I looked at them; they were very sick. They were almost on the bones because they was living there. They was in the bush. There was the bush, and then after, I think, there was a refugee camp. They went there. I have no word even to how to say or to greeting her, but women, they are very strong. I saw her, she stand up, and then she gave me a hug. And then we started crying over us. And when I tried to touch my boy, the one I left nine months. That's innocent. Yes, he did know me, so he couldn't allow me to touch. So he was a tired oh, man. Stunning. Yeah. So I have to stop that because I didn't want the baby to cry because he did know if I'm, I'm dead. Yeah. But uh, it was joy because I have seen them. But it was a very big uh, shock uh, also. How they look mm. like, what I'm going to do. But... The life it started again like that. So it was it was mm-hmm. achievement, but it was also a challenge. Yeah. It's really I'm just sort of taking that in because it's like you said, it could be seen as a really joyous moment of relief, but there is so much happening in that room in that moment when you see your wife and family together. It's not simple, is it? Yes. Yeah. It was supposed to be joy, but I look around where I am. Now, how am I going to support the family, whatever? Living, it is going to be hard. You have to look after them. Yeah. What did Noera tell you about their years in Burundi without you and what happened after you left? 
she told me what she passed through with the kids, how many times they survive. They was about to die, how they was in the bush, and then they had the military chasing them. They were sleeping <laughs> in the cave many times, and the mosquito biting them, and they need no food. And uh, the kids, they were sick. The stomach it was big because of no nutrition. And yeah. it was for her also, she was very sick. They have no clothes. And just... so she told me a lot, and she told me how my mom also died. And also how other people died, and uh, my brother, my also his wife, how did for her she even she saw more more than what mm-hmm. I saw. The news the family brought was heartbreaking. Stories of fear, attacks, and death. Stanny listened as he found out that his parents had both been killed in the war, as well as his brother and sister-in-law. And now, after over four years without any contact, Stanny's wife and children were with him in Uganda. Where they don't know nobody. You can imagine yourself how they, how they are going to survive in a new environment where they don't know no, nobody, where they have no language. Mm. And then I didn't have also much money to shopping a lot for the two, live with them. Sometimes I have it to go without nothing. And uh, kids, you know, the kids, they get, they learn a very quick language. My son, he learned a quick language and then he, he was a helping mom <laughs> yeah, <that's laughs> for good. shopping. Because yeah, the kids, yeah. they don't care whatever they talk. Mm. Yeah, so. They're like little sponges, aren't they, kids? Yeah. They absorb everything. Yeah. I think something that's really telling about Stanny and his wife, Noera, is that even though things were already tough, they still adopted Stanny's late brother's children and another young girl in need of care, a little girl called Joy. They took in children who were alone and needed help. So Stanny's family were now finally safe and making a new life for themselves in Uganda. Over the years, Stanny's work took off and he travelled to Europe, Australia and the USA, sharing his incredible knowledge of chimpanzees and how to work with them. You worked on a project called Roots and Shoots, which you joined in 2017, and that was about community outreach and helping people understand chimps to try and keep chimp populations safe. And then in 2018, you were invited to work at Chimp Eden in South Africa on the recommendation of Dr. Jane Goodall. And it sounds like you've developed some very good friendships with the chimps again, haven't you? Yes. Any particular friends that you've made? Cozy. Cozy. Cozy is, a, is a, my best friend. Every morning I have to go him and then we can shaking a hand. <laughs> <laughs> oh, nice. <laughs> good morning, Cozy. It's shaky, very formal. Yeah, I like it. <laughs> because uh, I'm the first person to go mm. around the night room and uh, normally Cozy, he's already awake and then he, he has to greeting me and then I have to greeting him and then he has to invite me. He's a guy who likes entertainment and uh, mm. people, they call him Crazy Uncle Cozy. Crazy Uncle Cozy. Yeah. <laughs> Because he likes to throw stones to visitors. Uh huh. That's kind of crazy. <laughs> <laughs> do chimpanzees make actually like, good friends? Like, obviously, you can enjoy your time with them, but do they make good friends? Yes, they do. They can do food friendly with staff. They can do good friend among themselves. So they do. They can mm-hmm. choose. To, you are my friend. We can let spend time. Let we pray. Yeah, mm-hmm. they they do. They are they are like human. Have you ever been afraid? Because chimps are, you know, they are quite, they can be quite aggressive. Um, I have get a challenge, but I have come out of that without any big injured. Yeah. What does it feel like? And I know that, um, you know, that something that's really, really important to say is that physical interaction with chimps is not encouraged for the chimps and for and for people as well. And that's that's a very important thing to kind of highlight. But you in your work in conservation and looking after chimps, you have been groomed many, many times by chimps and you've groomed them as well. What does it feel like being groomed by a chimp? Oh, it's special. Hmm. It is special because it is not common where you get that. And uh, What does it physically feel like? Does it like they sort of just pick at you and what do they do? Yes, they're just touching in the hair. Hmm. But today I don't have much hair. <laughs> <laughs> but I, 
before when I was still have a much hair, and then they touch, and then they convince you, to, oh, I have seen something, and then there are some sound they use to convince you to say, don't go anywhere. I have seen something. Okay. <laughs> I've got see something in your hair. Sit down. They use the sound. Do you want to listen to that sound? Yeah, what's that sound? Okay, this is the sound for grooming. Turns out the microphone didn't pick up this sound in the studio at the time, but Stanny sent us a voice note later. Not what I was expecting. Amazing. In their community, the grooming, grooming, it is much pleasure, it is love, it is short, I love you. What have chimps taught you about yourself, about who you are in your life? Uh, what did they teach me? It is a lot. <laughs> chimps, they teach me about uh, forgiveness, okay? Because uh, the human, when I make you angry, you can keep it for long, for many years, okay? But the chimps, if they fight and they injure each other, they have to give a hug each other. So means mm. the problem is to sort of don't do it again. It seems like there is a, lo- a lot that has happened in your life that would be very, very difficult to forgive. But has working with chimps changed that for you? Yes. Uh, forgiveness, it is one way to solve also the problem. Because if you don't, forgive someone who hurt you and you want to do revenge, you will never solve sort of, that why their war never stop in the world because everyone wanted to do revenge, to revenge, never solve the problem. We, we are lacking forgiveness. Chimps, mm-hmm. they forgive and then they can start life, continue. Stanny still works with chimps in South Africa and across the world. He's co-written a book called The Chimpanzee Whisperer. A life of love and loss, compassion and conservation. And he's looking to write another one, so watch this space. And then, just before we had to leave the studio, um, this happened. Okay, I'm going to say bye-bye for the uh, chimp language, and then, Paul, you, you are going to reply. You are chimp, you are chimp also. <laughs> okay. Good night. <laughs> okay. That was terrible. <laughs> I keep it keep it practice. <laughs> I'm so sorry. I tried Stanny. I tried. <laughs> okay, but you remember for me, I have I have been working chimpanzee over 30 years. So we can't say it. you can be better like me for just one minute. But thank you for practice. <laughs> thank you, Stanley. Thank you so much okay. for joining <laughs> us and for sharing all of that with us. And we can't wait to hear what you do next. Okay. My huge thanks to Stanley Niandwi, protector and friend of chimpanzees. You've been listening to Lives Less Ordinary from the BBC World Service. I'm India Rackerson. The producer was May Cameron and our editor this week was Andrea Kennedy. If you've enjoyed this episode, please do like, follow and share. We also love your feedback, so please drop us a line or send us a voice note. Just head to the BBC Lives Less Ordinary website. Next time, Mabin Azar hears from Tariq Mehmood, an immigrant teenager facing racism and homelessness in 1970s Britain. He found shelter and wisdom in a library and eventually took on not only the racists on the streets, but the British legal system too. Don't miss it. From me, India Rackerson, and the whole team here, thanks for listening. Match of the Day Africa Top 10 is the new podcast celebrating the best of African football. It must be his best ever goal. Whoa! Incredible. Incredible. Each week, Yaya Toure, Efe Nakoku and me, Gabriel Zakwani, try to decide who should be crowned number one in our best of African football list. This is where it gets interesting. What a player, what a player. I think we know who number one is. There'll be some familiar faces. I play with both of them. Both are special. And some tricky decisions. Guys, stop being emotional. <laughs> We're talking about being realistic. I won't argue anymore. <laughs> and we might even make it onto a list or two ourselves. I just needed one list. You've been in many lists. <laughs> we don't need you in this list again. 
That's Match of the Day Africa Top 10 from the BBC World Service. Woo, that's the one. Find it wherever you get your BBC podcasts.